everybody, welcome back to Is It Kino? Uh, second half of our Barbenheimer review. Of course, uh, E-Rich and Weekend are back. Yes, oh, we're week. here. What a week, guys. Am I right? Yeah, what'd you guys do in the week between the Barbie review and this review? I, I just sat here and thought about Oppenheimer the entire time. I was I jacked off, so it, it was a fun. <laughs> I was telling Albert Einstein to be really mean to Robert Downey Jr. for no reason. <laughs> yeah, Han Solo was in the movie. I was like, oh damn, this is gonna be good. This is gonna be a good time. Dude, Han Solo was wait. one of the best actors in the movie too. He was great. Yeah. Right? When he realized he was he, he was played. Okay. I'm sorry. I can't yeah, wait in ahead. forty or fifty years for that to be a huge reveal. Is that you told <laughs> Albert Einstein to be mean? Mm -hmm. Or wait, you told Robert Oppenheimer to be mean to RDJ. Yeah. Well, boys, where do we begin with uh, this existential crisis of a film? Ooh. I guess we should talk about the the beautiful titties that were on screen multiple times. Oh, okay. Can I just say? Fucking Christopher Nolan did it. He he went audience, viewer, dear viewer, Florence Pugh, grinding, topless, is <laughs> integral to the plot, and he fucking Several did time. it. It fucking Several did it. It's time. amazing. Several and, times. And she's gonna give eye contact to Emily Blunt while she's doing it in a room of like ten men. Oh my god. Hot. Hot. So hot. <laughs> she she NTR'd Emily Blunt. That deserves an Oscar. Holy shit. Now here's my conspiracy. This is a movie that is 98% just people standing around talking or sitting in a small conference room and talking. Uh, mm -hmm. There's really no excuse for this to actually be filmed with IMAX cameras. So I think he just wanted to give us like the highest HD <laughs> shots of these titties, and he—that was his excuse. Was no, the He's whole like, movie has to be IMAX for some reason. Also, also seventy millimeter is what he filmed. Yes. So it's like the most fidelity, the the yeah. like highest possible quality. Bravo, okay. Nolan. I think he sent a tweet, monkey, where where some guy screenshotted I mean, took a picture of, of Florence Pugh yeah and he had the flash yeah. on <laughs> <laughs> of course you have to get you have to get it accurately I totally fucking get yeah, it he could not wait two months for the movie to come out on the <laughs> digital release he had to take a photo of the movie screen of her titties yeah. out he needed that release early if you know what I mean yeah. did you see that over in India they CGI'd a black dress onto her ugh lame what the fuck Fucking weak. I if I, if I were them, I would fucking riot. I would take to the streets. I would start smashing shit until yeah. they took the fucking CGI dress off. Yeah. Of yeah. The Indians are gonna start shitting in the streets out of protest instead of just for fun. Instead of just normal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, e. Rich, you're probably the smarter of uh, of all of us, I assume. I don't know. Uh, tell oh, us about this is, this intellectual movie and where we should begin the discussion. Um, I I was bowled over by this movie, if only because I knew very little about the the life of uh, Oppenheimer as a man, and I think this is one of the best biopics I've ever seen, just because of how relentlessly paced it is. This is a three hour long movie that to me at least does not feel like it's three hours. It feels like two hours just because it's so breakneck. It is you sprinting from scene to scene to scene to scene. Nolan like is just filling you in on what you need to know. And I think I could keep up through most of the movie, but I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it again to like let all of the pieces just fall into place. Were any of you like confused during the movie at all? No. It, it took me about half an hour to figure out, okay, we're seeing just bits and pieces scattered about throughout time, uh, just mm -hmm. like almost thrown in like a random order. But then once I picked up on it and that really th – this opening scene with him and uh, Einstein is kind of the – like the Inception top moment at the end of the movie. Like what did he say to him? Uh, right. All right. of that really came together by the end of the film. He's like planting pieces scattered throughout Oppenheimer's like uh, life to like yeah. give you things to latch on to and then he'll return to those things and make them more like more important as it goes on until then like at that last moment you realize uh i mean basically to me at least it seems like this movie is about reckoning with your powers as a scientist and how the things you are like discovering about the world can be taken away from you and used 
as like an offensive weapon, as something that completely reshapes and restructures human society in a way, and how Oppenheimer just jumped headfirst into that and was fine with being part of that and then felt guilty about it later. And I think there's a strong undercurrent of guilt and sense of Mm -hmm. responsibility throughout the throughout the movie and and mm-hmm. like Oppenheimer is the guilty part it feels guilty and 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 what the fuck is Robert Downey Jr's character's name I, I, I Strauss 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 is like <laughs> evading responsibility almost like the twist I didn't know this this was a real thing apparently this was like there was a J Oppenheimer thing right in real life I, I am not familiar with American history and that mm-hmm. twist where he was actually the guy manipulating it I was like if you didn't know Oppenheimer, what happened to him, that was such an effective turnaround. And I and I feel with Alden Ehrenreich when he goes, you were playing me all this fucking time. And, <laughs> and, and then RDJ was like smugly saying, of course I fucking played you, moron. It's like, mm-hmm. it's it's such a good... And he doesn't get it, like what he did. Like he, he at the, at, when he was ranting, when he was like, oh, I, I did him a favor. I martyred him. It's like... Bitch, you psycho. <laughs> uh, can That's I... Crazy, man. I, I want to give my interpretation of, like, the ending and what the movie means, and I'm yeah, a no, self-acclaimed uh, midwit. I'm very stupid, so <laughs> I might be getting this wrong, but uh-huh. my interpretation of the film is that uh, Strauss, the Robert Downey Jr. character, uh, in his infinite narcissism, has doomed all of humanity, and he doesn't, like, it, we, ha- we have not faced that repercussion yet, but now, like, it's the chain reaction that has begun. Uh, basically, when he um, he uh, fucked over, I guess I can't think of the smart guy word right now because it's uh, I guess noon is too early in the morning for me. But he <laughs> he, he made it so that uh, Oppenheimer would lose his security clearance at a time yep. when Oppenheimer he has this fear of okay, we made the atomic bomb, but now they're going to make these hydrogen bombs that are even more destructive. And he has this yep. image in his head of what if they just strap it to a missile and they can just shoot it around the world and then the whole world's gone. Uh, so if I maintain this security clearance, I can be a voice in the room and try to prevent this from happening. But Strauss thinking, oh, he he talked shit about me to Einstein. I'm going to get all this shit revoked and fuck him over. Uh, basically, that has doomed all of humanity. Is that a fair interpretation? That, I think that's pretty fair. That's that's exactly yeah. what the movie is is presenting. Okay. With, yeah. Okay. So so man's folly is not that he's capable of great scientific achievement, but that this one guy was narcissistic and thought that every conversation around him had to be about him. Meanwhile, yeah, they're like, talk, like the real conversation was, yeah, I think we just doomed humanity. <laughs> uh huh. No, and I think there's a there's a fair way to interpret Oppenheimer as being egotistical, also. Like you yeah. could also you could also see the movie as one man's ego, but someone actually learned from from their destructive ego how destructive it could be, and someone didn't, and he doomed humanity. You could also look at it that way. Well, but he is the guy who understands like it, what is happening more than anybody, and he knows like yeah. okay, this is one step we did to Japan, but like if we keep going with this technology, the whole world is going to be fucking destroyed, and mm-hmm. uh, and he wants to be in the room to to you know give that perspective and now he can't do that anymore that mm-hmm. fucking speech scene was so good and and i like that nolan was like teasing it in the in the black and white scene or was it colored i forget now where rdj where strauss and and oppenheimer were talking about the russian leak of the nuclear mm-hmm. test and there was the stomping of the foot and you don't get it yet why he thought of that moment and then mm-hmm. after you see the bomb exploding and and the people were cheering Oppenheimer on you, you could see what he was seeing like the carbonized bodies of the people the the melting face of the lady and so it's like it's like his sin it's like burned into his fucking mind it's 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 mm-hmm. such a good movie and when I, I, I'm just gushing on how good this fucking film is because I've been seeing shit throughout this whole year and this is the first time I was like oh fuck you fucking did it when when the bomb exploded right and you don't hear the bomb yet you can just hear the like it's anticipation but also it's a callback to when they were fucking and then yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's almost like it's like sexual moans and like I've become death destroyer of worlds there's also a pun there where, where the orgasm is like the little death in French it's like 
like this this man this fucking Nolan guy did a fucking based biopic and I and I was like oh oh my god I I went in the theater I I I, I oddly said Tang Ina he did it and, and like oh my god it's such a fucking it's like a fucking good scene it's like there's so many layers to that moment right like, there's been a, there's been a lot of talk about like whether we were right to nuke the Japanese whether like creating that weapon using it and how that has completely restructured the entirety of society since then like all of the like breakdowns of moral culpability and who was right who was wrong this movie does such a great job of mm-hmm. framing Oppenheimer's decision to do those things and his kind of having to deal with the fallout of having to do those things as kind of co-equal things in his mind that he's willing to take on but also cannot like resist doing that like he feels incredibly guilty about doing these things but he knew ahead of time how dangerous and terrible those things would be but but chose to do it anyway there's a lot of things that get kind of uh contracted down into you need to stop the nazis the nazis are the people who if they get this bomb they could rule the entire world with a glove of terror and hitler is awful and then at that point when they're making the bomb it's like oh we defeated the nazis the thing you're doing this to stop has been stopped but they keep doing it anyway they like there is an an inevitability to creation and to the entire might of the u.s like uh military complex the u.s industrial complex everything just coming together to say yeah you need to make this fucking thing and oppenheimer sees it as a challenge he wants to do rather than like viewing it as this like well the moral cause of this is now gone he just wants to do it to do it like yeah he's put this team together he's brought all of these things into place to get this bomb made he's gonna make the bomb like <laughs> Yeah, and there's a call back to that scene, Erich, where where the mock trial where the lawyer was just ramming it. Oh, so what changed in the, in the from 1943 to now? What happened then, yeah. motherfucker? And then and yeah. then the and then the siren was playing and the and the flashing lights. It's in his head. It's like it's almost the same. It's it's such a right. good. It's like the language of fucking cinema. If some yeah. other director did it, it's like. Oh, Oppenheimer! Didn't you think you were? It, this is the same thing as the the thing you did way back when. I think it's morally equivalent, Your Honor. It's like <laughs> it's such a good yeah, scene. Like, he genie out of the bottle, and now he has regrets about it. He like isn't sure about going further even than what he's created. And yeah, I mean, the the guy who's played by Benny Safty, I can't remember what his name is in the thing, uh, is the guy yeah. who was saying all this time. We, we can actually do a better version of this. There's an H-bomb we can make. We can use yeah. hydrogen and use reactions based off of that. And I, I feel like it's partially Oppenheimer's own like ego that says, no, we're like sticking with this. We want to do this. I don't think it's his like moral complex that he's he's not willing to go into that. It's more just like I built this entire apparatus to make the bomb using fission based off the fissile materials that we're collecting, I don't want to look into hydrogen. Uh, so he kind of lets that guy do his thing, but not really like dig further into it. Yeah, that, that's that's super, super. Teller, Edward Teller. Yeah. The father yeah, of the hydrogen bomb. And the funny mm-hmm. thing is th- that guy faced repercussions after. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, yeah uh-huh. he got ostracized by the scientific community afterwards. Yeah, like, yeah. It's amazing. Like, like I Wikipedia after. Like, what happened to this fucker afterwards? Like, uh, Benny Safdie has come a long way from playing Robert Pattinson's retarded brother. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> One of the smartest did. men ever. Versus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, he's that's, got that's real range. Hydrogen, that's the hydrogen bomb versus coughing baby of. <laughs> <laughs> but he was great in uh, Good Time, anyway. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this movie is like full to bursting full of actors from like various things Josh Peck is the man who like pushes the button to test the entire yeah I, I didn't want to talk yeah. about that like has Christopher yeah. Nolan not seen Josh Peck's other work he, he's a bit of a, <laughs> a bumbling boob some might say I don't know if I would trust him with the the button that launches the nuke mm-hmm. uh, basically every actor who won best actor in the last decade shows up in this movie <laughs> yeah yeah Nolan, okay. Nolan is like looking through a bunch of actors. Has anyone here seen the Santa Claus? 
Like the movie with, with Tim, Tim Allen. Allen? Yeah. No, what, yeah. Why? What? The head, the head elf in that movie, plays Oppenheimer's Jewish friend in this. No like, way. Kind of yeah, the yeah, that's the th- same actor. Is he? Is he? David Crumholtz. Yeah. Oh my mm-hmm. god. Oh my god, like, he got fat. <laughs> Nolan has fat, and like Josh Hartnett is the one friend of him, the like very good looking scientist guy who's kind of like iffy Lawrence. on the communism stuff. Yeah, Lawrence. yeah, like. He has found all of these actors like spread throughout the system who like have had success as young men, but have kind of fallen off since then. And it has like grabbed all of them and like pushed them into this movie because Alden Ehrenreich was Han Solo. But then uh, that movie didn't do well. And now he's like, yeah. he's bringing him back here. Like Rami no Malek hasn't done shit fucking... for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Kenneth Branagh he's shows still... up without his mustache. So fucking on point with casting in this movie. Talking it's fucking insane. Dane DeHaan? Yeah. Dane DeHaan! <laughs> there, there's Tell like me. a scanner, a, practically a jump scare in this movie where the, a like flower uh, vase is taken away and Dane DeHaan was behind there the entire time. And it's like, what the fuck? That was Dane DeHaan back there? <laughs> no, fucking Gary Oldman is Truman. Yeah. yeah. Did you know that? I did not I even, did not I did not know, know that. that was Gary Oldman. No, I, I knew it was. Know. Fuck, I, I think it was Gary Oldman from the very beginning. Uh, the Naked <laughs> Brothers funny. Band kid is in this. Casey Affleck, Jack Quaid, oh. like every Fucking male Affleck actor one ever. Of the scariest, one of the scariest people ever. They do such a good job of like building him up in like about 30 seconds. And then he appears and Casey Affleck is so weirdly like soft spoken, but mm-hmm. has this like scary edge to him that like he's just so oh my god yeah he's in god. maybe what three minutes of screen time and i think he yeah. has he has more yeah. dialogue than the entirety of a ghost story <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's fu- fucked up it's wild fucking hacker autistic man what the fuck is his name is is the guy that screws over strauss well rami, rami malek. malek yeah, yeah. rami malek Ro- robot i ro- i robot or mr robot that's it yeah mr i robot mm-hmm. Mr. I Robot <laughs> fucking screwed. I thought what was going to happen since I don't know American history. I was like, you're right, Mr. Strauss. Oppenheimer is a fucker. I thought that was going to happen. <laughs> and then he goes, actually, motherfucker, you screwed over Oppenheimer because you're a petty piece mm-hmm. of shit. Yeah, I Jason 100% Clark. did not see a twist villain coming in this movie. So the entire, yeah. like, the third act with Robert Downey Jr., I think, secured him, if not a nomination, like, just straight up the supporting actor. Winning. Oscar. Yeah. yeah. It was so good. Absolutely. The turn was so good. And he does, and Nolan does the trick where he doesn't reveal everything. When, when, uh, when Strauss was speculating about somebody leaked this document to that motherfucker. And then when he's retelling the event, what the camera does is it just pans ever so slightly to see the motherfucking mastermind. It's so fucking great. Yeah, he's sitting like, there on the couch the, the whole time. Trip. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Evrich, can you explain the the difference between the black and white scenes and the the colored scenes, or uh, you know, yeah. s- scenes of color, color as we should call them? Yeah, the color. the color scenes are objective things that absolutely happened exactly how you're seeing them, and the black and white scenes are subjective, which means it's from some character's point of view as they're seeing things. So. I think a lot of the black and white scenes can be seen as either Strauss's point of view or from Oppenheimer's point of view as isn't, they're isn't happening. It, isn't it the other way around? The colored scenes are... Oh, like, is it? One? We can really? Check. Yeah, okay. I saw the colored yeah. scenes as this is how Oppenheimer sees what's going on, and then black and white is like historical documents. Yeah, we can see. The colored scenes are subjective. The black and white scenes are... Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I got it mixed up. Yeah. Wait, so fucking Strauss went on a psychotic rant? That that really happened? <laughs> it seems like it. Holy shit. Oh my god, yeah. Alden Ehrenreich's guy was like taking notes on everything he was saying. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't be surprised. I'll write that down. That's, right, this is going to be great in the movie. I was right there with Alden Ehrenreich when, when he was like, you tricked me. Like, I can't... That scene and the way he acted it. Oh my god, that was so brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't believe I, that he needed acting say, coaches on the set of Solo. He's he's a pretty good actor. He, he, he's really good. I, I'd say fucking Robert Downey Jr. has not been in a movie. I guess he was in that fucking uh, Doolittle movie a couple <laughs> years ago that nobody gave a shit about or or he just cared needed to money. See. He, he they needed really thought having money. Iron Man in it would bring in the box office, huh? He has been Iron Man for fucking 2008 to 2019. Is that, is yeah. that right? 
or is it 2018? But like over a decade, and I feel like it's done some harm to his career as much as he's like made dump trucks full of money. Yeah, no, he's the richest actor in the world. I I think his career is going okay. But it's kind of hard to like break out of that and become a serious actor again after being a fucking like toy toy soldier. Oh, uh, that is uh, not actually. fair, though. He gives compelling uh, performances in Endgame and in Infinity War, I would say. Even no, sure, Civil but he, War. he's been that one character. Actors, like, jump from character to character to character and, like, embody different people. He has embodied the same man for so long True. and hasn't really done anything else. So, it, like, I, I think Robert Downey Jr. was worried, is like, can, can I still do this? Can I still take on another role? And he fucking pulls it off, man. I mean, yeah. I'm sure that the makeup is doing some some help there, but he, he absolutely does it. It's, we it's need wild. Ben Stiller to write Tropic Thunder 2 and he can do blackface again. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. He, they should do it. They should fucking do It's a great it. movie. I'm so, I'm so he ready. He should do old man blackface where like, he's, he's playing him <laughs> Like Uncle Ruckus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if he could get away with that again. I think that was a 2008 exclusive. Our culture would not allow it, I don't think. Can I just say Cillian Murphy is great in this? He's so he's fun. fucking phenomenal. If he doesn't win Best Actor, the, whoever wins has to like have given the best. Well, best he's going to be up against uh, Leo DiCaprio Le- for Killers yeah. of the Flower Moon. Peak Leo. He's at the peak, I think. But Le- yeah, Leo already got his Oscar. They're going to give this one to Cian. The, the, he was so good. I, I was like, Tommy, kill him. Kill him, motherfuckers. I was like... Another lesson I learned from fucking Oppenheimer is that even if you're a smart, intelligent man, you should learn how to play politics. You should know how to play the fucking game. And he got he got played like a fucking fiddle, and he got bailed out morally, but his reputation and his influence really diminished afterwards. I, I like that scene at the end where Einstein went, you know, there when there, when it, when you're done, they're just gonna use you, but they're, it's mm-hmm. only for them. It's like it's like a good. It's like a poignant moment. I like that, that, when that's, that's an amazing moment to me just because you have to then like go back to everything and be like, he knew this the entire time going in. He knew yeah. that he was going to become like just an instrument for the military to use as they want and then kind of discarded. Like the moments when he's waiting for a phone call, he's like, I want to know when they tell me that they've done it and yeah. that the thing I've been working on all this time has been either a success or a failure. Or whatever. Oh, it's so. Yeah, he has to learn so about great. it on the radio along with all the normies. Yes. They yes. don't even yeah. care. Uh, there's and, and one. I'll like... oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Mom. I was going to say, uh, well, yeah. I'm going to detract this big time because I want to talk about an actor whose name we have not mentioned, I don't think yet, and that is Mr. Matt Damon. Uh, oh, fuck yeah. Let's... Did anybody else get the impression that Matt Damon sort of stole the movie whenever he was in a scene because he's like he's basically playing the Matt Damon character from every other Matt Damon movie maybe I just don't Mm -hmm. find him versatile but like the dialogue he had is so reminiscent of just the the funny dialogue he would have in any movie and it feels like he almost came in and and doctored the script with his own lines (laughs) (laughs) he is almost in a different movie in a way like a lot of the bomb parts of this movie are very like you get the team together, you figure things out. It's it's more of a process movie than it is like a like biopic uh, about one man's kind of kind of journey through this terrible thing. But I think that lends the movie such great energy, and it, it's almost like if the Oppenheimer movie were more of a dad movie completely. That's what ben, I'm sorry, not Ben Affleck, fucking Matt. That's what Matt Damon is bringing to this movie is more of that straightforward military dad movie kind of energy, which I think works works for that section of the movie. And like, it's important to say that like Matt Damon is the one heavy military presence throughout the movie. The rest of these people are like scientists. The yeah, and the, and the military more. general is like the comic relief of the film, but he's also driving <laughs> yeah. this yeah. horrible invention. Mm hmm. And apparently in real life, those two Oppenheimer and Groves, I believe his name is, they got along fairly well and like were good partners to to work together on this, even when they have such different priorities. And I love that like push and pull of Groves trying to get him like a clearance, trying to get him what he needs in order to put this project together. There's something about that, about scientists and military people working together on something 
and the different priorities and the different way they work and like Matt Damon having to like juggle the like you can't talk to communists you can't like work with these people while you're working with the military on this stuff and just the like the shaky relations between the US and the Soviet Union during this time because we're both trying to get the Nazis but as soon as that stops we become enemies it's it's so great did, did you find the scene where he, when the military guy was picking targets, and he went like, "Oh, not Kyoto. That's a pretty." Uh huh. Yeah, I, I like I the vacation. There. Vacation. Oh yeah. god. Like that is such <laughs> a fucking. Hell. Like, are you fucking with me right now? Did this really happen? Well, and the even fact, in the thing that makes the determination is that this man has gone there before on vacation, so he doesn't want it to be bombed. Jesus Christ. But on the actual day of the bombing, didn't one city, like, they wanted to bomb it, but it was too cloudy, so they had to use a backup city? So, like, you know, oh, tens damn, of thousands really? of people's lives, you know, they got lucky. We're saved by a cloud. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what happened. God, that's so fucked up. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, is this movie yeah. a good example of uh, like if you want to teach your buddy, don't stick your dick in crazy? Show him yeah. this movie. Yeah. Oh, is probably. that kind of the lesson? Because yeah. he he completely gets fucked over just for having sex with the two communist women. That's kind of like the the nail in the coffin. This movie has so many fucking lessons, guys. Like, don't stick your dick in crazy. Learn how to play the game. Be smart and interesting. What else? I, I would, how to I make a bomb this movie. Yeah, how, how to make a fucking. <laughs> what are you talking about there, Erich? I, I like how much this movie went into his like communist affiliations and that he was involved in these groups leading up to making the bomb. Because I think there's a lot of things that have changed since, especially the 50s, have changed since we like went to war with Russia. Um, that. And this is p partially tied into the unionization of actors and uh, writers right now. They're striking to get the studios to to actually let up on some of these some of these things. The 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 idea that workers and people who have their own interests have their own kind of like lives lives in uh, in store for themselves and are unionizing and getting together and saying we're not going to put up with this shit anymore we want there to be standardized ways that we're paid and that we can't just be fired for no fucking reason the fact that that is an undercurrent of the first part of this movie are very interesting to me because it, it's how Oppenheimer sees the world is that there are balances to everything he, he's a quantum physicist so quantum physics has to do with like two things that can like be in the same place at the same time and like still coexist with one another and that's so close to how he thinks about things so like his guilt but it also his like ability to do something that is terrible that is yeah. awful can coexist at the same time and the way this movie oh opens my God. You're with, right. him, oh, with him going to a school and he hates the fucking professor who won't let him see a see a lecture by this guy so he poisons an apple to go and kill that man and then he gets incredibly guilty about it afterward and goes to try to retrieve that apple and stop it from happening is so like amazingly perfect of someone who makes a bomb that will destroy the world and like wreck all of our international kind of I don't know peace and then it feels incredibly guilty about it afterwards and wants to like stop or draw that back. It's such a, and that's something that actually happened. He did poison an apple for his professor. It's so fucking- Did he admit to this? <laughs> Where yes. did he write this down? What the fuck? I, I think they added the thing about him being guilty after, but that's such a fucking- Wait, so he, in reality, he let him eat the apple? Uh, I don't know whether he didn't actually eat the apple. Let me, let me go. Hmm. Well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We're talking a lot about the moral implications of this, but is anybody else kind of pro-atomic bomb here? <laughs> or is it just me? <laughs> Listen, I don't know if you've ever heard of mutually assured destruction, but I think the invention of these nuclear weapons might have led to the greatest uh, era of peace mankind will ever know. There's a reason why we haven't had a World War III, and that's because of these fucking bombs, right? Sounds like gobbledygook from communists there. Mm, I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. If I get a fuck, uh, what's her name, then I guess I'll be a communist. 
Yeah. <laughs> if I get to fuck Black Widow's sister. Yeah, I think that was like that was a cope they were saying, right? Uh, if we, but, if we but is that a cope in reality? Isn't that just kind of a fact? Yeah, but the under yeah, it's it's like when it's going back to what Eric said. There's like this weird. It's like the two opposite. It's like the two things that are occupying the same space, right? There is peace, but there's still this undercurrent that at any moment you could destroy the atmosphere and and fuck everyone over. There's always <laughs> that. There's that tension that is still present today, I think. Really, it, it wasn't just an evolution of mankind's scientific prowess, but a, an evolution of an eye for an eye, really. Like, yeah. if, if you Pearl Harbor me once, I'm going to atomic bomb you twice, motherfucker. <laughs> you know? That. Erich, am I off base here? Have, have the existence of nuclear weapons not led to a more peaceful world? Only, only because other people have gotten them. Like that, sure. that's, that yeah. kind of equalizing force is that is that other nations having nukes have stopped us from using them because like th that that's what mass. Uh, oh, why can't I fuck remember what it's called? Mad? Mutually assured destruction. That, yeah. That's what it is, is that if we use them, someone's going to use them on us in retaliation. So. Yeah. So now, like, nobody's ever going to use them again. Assuredly. Right, guys? I hope. Hmm. I hope. We hope. Yeah, like, yeah, that's, that's kind hope. of... <laughs> And th that's what Oppenheimer was talking about uh, when he was kind of, yeah, is that like, yeah. we can't just have one nation that has the ability to it over everyone else. You need to either everyone has them or, or no one has them is the only way to play. I do think we would look on it differently if instead of dropping them on Japan, if we actually did have the opportunity to bomb like Nazi Germany, I think people mm -hmm. would have a lot more reverence for uh, these events. And yeah, uh, is anybody else interested that four of the six creators of this atomic bomb were uh, Jewish men? Is it safe to say the Jews have doomed humanity? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> he just says yeah immediately. Yeah. <laughs> If it's right, it's right. <laughs> Am I right, mm -hmm. my fellow... <laughs> my fellow Jewish friends? Yeah, my fellow guys, our guys. <laughs> the Jew enjoyers? Yeah. What am I get? It's such a great movie. <laughs> no, I, I can't say enough about it. Because, like, the double irony that Strauss is also defeated in a sham kangaroo court that's mm -hmm. not really a court. It's like, mm, It's like sweet fucking karma. It's like, I, I don't damn. remember if I mentioned him, but Jason Clark plays the prosecutor in oh, that little I hated him so room. much. He oh, is so good. Great. That's perfect casting of I fucking hate Jason Clark just because of his fucking face. <laughs> I just look at his fucking face and I'm just like, I hate this man. I fucking want to see him in the dirt. And, and the way he so smugly asks questions. Yes. Like, oh, yes. No, but Emily Blunt has such a great moment against yeah, him because you agree, hate his agree. fucking guts and you want to see him fail. And when she is like correcting him and like trying to like use semantics to like pull down his argument, it, it's such a great little moment for her. And yeah. a lot has been made about how like there's no women in this movie or women don't talk at all in this movie. Nolan is aware of that and is is making sure that there's a moment for her where she's not crying, holding a baby or alcoholic uh, throughout it, so. If Greta Gerwig directed the film, like half of the people on the bomb team would be like obese black women and stuff. <laughs> so at least no one kept it historically accurate with the lack of women. Yeah. Open yeah, Iron they played. There's a woman in the lab and they do have a, uh, a line referencing yeah. that. Oppenheimer would be played by a, a woman, by Amy Schumer. <laughs> Cause she turned down the Barbie movie. Yeah, for Oppenheimer. <laughs> Uh, are there any other major aspects of the film we should dive into? Hmm. Um, did you guys like the Trinity test sequence? Just the the lead up to that. Uh, yeah. it, the fucking Teller has his uh, UV uh, sunscreen that he pastes all over his face, and he looks like a fucking fucking moron. <laughs> I like the goggles that they use also. Like, Jack Wade is there as Richard Feynman with his bongos. Oh, man. Fucking Jack Wade is hilarious. He's got yeah. bongos, which apparently that guy really did have bongos. Yeah. I'm and sure. It's, Feynman's such a great... I mean, he's also an interesting physicist in his own right. Yeah, it never uh, really very... occurred to me that they would have to watch the test by, like, laying down in the opposite direction and watching it through a mirror. 
Yeah, like they hold up, all hold up a mirror trying to see the, the reflection of it. Yeah, it's funny that one guy went fuck it and just went outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I like so I saw this on IMAX 70 millimeter. Uh, the movie looked incredible, uh, projected on film, much as Nolan intended it to. Um, God intended, yeah. <laughs> as God, Nolan and God intended. Yeah, um, yeah. The movie looks incredible on film. I, I would say anyone who cares about that kind of thing absolutely go and see it in 70 millimeter in IMAX if possible. Oh, it's too late. Um, All those showings are sold out, E. Rich. Oh man, that fucking hurts me. And there should you, be way more. There was a story of like people who desperately wanted to see it in this format. They like ordered a, you know, they went on a plane and like they flew to another state, <laughs> and then the showing like went wrong and it got canceled. And now they're just fucked. Like they can never see yeah. it because all the showings there, are sold out. There's no way to like repay you for that. There's no way to make it right. Really, they should like, just expand it. Like there's nothing coming out in August. Just keep showing the 70 millimeter. IMAX until a good movie comes out. Like they better not replace this shit with fucking Blue Beetle and IMAX, or I'd be pissed. Oh my yeah. god, I hope I hope not. Jesus. Oh, I, I yeah, that's true. The, the state the state of projection, the state of like showing exec, exhibiting movies essentially is so fucked in this country and then all over the world. There's only like 30 70 millimeter uh, projectors running, I think, all across oh the my world. God. The that's US bad. has tons of them. And then the rest of the world has only a couple. So it kind of sucks. I really wish that more filmmakers would care about this as much. I know that Quentin Tarantino released The Hateful Eight in 70 millimeter. I went to go see that when it came out. And then this has been, I believe, the last IMAX 70 millimeter movie that was in wide release. But yeah, just there is something about the chemical nature of film that you're seeing something that's projected on massive film reels that are just running and running and running during my screening there was a bunch of like hair or dust that got on the film print and it's wow. just fun it's fun to see something like on screen alongside the thing it like cleared up yeah, for the rest of the movie but it feels real it, interaction it is there yeah. is a film strip that is running and you are seeing it interact with things in the room it's 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 wild it's different and it's kind of insane that you're saying that that's the superior way to see the film is that fucking the, the projectionist hair <laughs> got into the film. That's crazy. You know, you know that's that's it's a, it's a physical process. It's it's science. Yeah, you should listen. The sound design on this fucking thing is so goddamn. Oh, cool. man, so, it, it's fucking like, incredible. People complain about Nolan's sound design. I really couldn't not hear anything throughout the movie, so. I didn't have any problems with this with the sound for this one. Oh yeah, much better than the dialogue in Tenet in the opening scene when I <laughs> did not understand it, a single word. And mm. this is fucking this. There was the scene where Oppenheimer's words were being drowned out by noise. I think th that's a very big part of that scene, and the way the sound reverberates after an explosion, and you could feel it travel through the cinema. You should really watch this in the theater. You're underselling yeah. it if you if you don't watch it. I mean, it's, I think this will be a good story. But just seeing it on an IMAX or an Atmos or whatever the fuck, it's just the way the sound moves in in the in the cinema is amazing. Yeah, Ludwig Göransson's score as well. Uh, yeah, he did the tenant as the well. The Oppenheimer, but, uh, the Oppenheimer theme, where we just like strings that are like op oppressive yet beautiful yet serene. Like yeah, it's it's like the yeah, you're right here. It's like the theme is. Two things occupying the same space at once. How does that fucking work? And it's yep. fucking Oppenheimer. Th that is such a great. <laughs> that's such a great summary of it. That's... Yeah, and that's just just brilliant. in general, this is this is what filmmaking is about. It's about uniting images and sound and uh, actors and chemistry and all of these things just into one viewing for you as an audience member. Hopefully, everyone. Respectful. Hopefully nobody's on their fucking phone. But people, and I know that this is a fucking meme that like American audiences will like applaud after a movie. <laughs> but people <laughs> applauded. Uh, only a couple of people, but I joined in. Is just we all witness something when you go to a theater and you see it together with a group of people, and th that's something special. That's something worth getting out of your fucking house, going into a theater and seeing it together nolan is one of the filmmakers 
who really respects that and wants people to have a good good time at the movies together seeing that and yeah th- there's nothing quite like the movies and I hope that they keep doing as well this movie is doing fucking great which I, I love like 80 million dollars domestic for this movie I know the Barbie way out performed it but this is a three hour long biopic that no, it does not it, it, it's not a crowd pleaser but it got an A cinema score like and yeah, the budget was crazy. only a hundred million dollars like take some fucking notes you stupid fucking executives <laughs> like why yeah, did Indiana just... Jones cost 340 million dollars to make and then you have this masterpiece that cost a fraction of that yeah it's it's, it's I can't say enough things good about it Is it okay Okay, challenge time, guys. What did you not like about the movie? Oh, uh, well, Christopher Nolan used the wrong American flag. It took me right out of the movie. I was counting the stars in the theater. Where are the Japanese people? Like some fucker in an internment out. camp where they belong. Oh wow, that's Making right, our George Takei. Cartoons, goddammit. <laughs> Well, Oppenheimer never apologized for uh, the bombing of Hiroshima or Nagasaki and really didn't kind of acknowledge that that horror that he unleashed. Well, Truman so said wish, you didn't do what I did it, so you can't I, be sorry. I wish that Nolan had changed history and had J. Robert Oppenheimer in full IMAX talk to the Japanese people that he uh, that he yeah. slaughtered and just to say I am sorry for that the fucking scene where he goes into Truman's office and Truman calls him a crybaby waves <laughs> the fucking hanky in his face and tells him to get the fuck out and never let him in there again that was fucking incredible weird. fucking a top 10 moment of, of this movie I, I fucking whispered in the cinema like oh it's the meme scene I keep I keep seeing on 4chan <laughs> they keep see, they keep posting that on 4chan where, where it's like <laughs> Truman being based and Oppenheimer being a weak shit. It's like, oh, it actually fucking happened. Holy shit. <laughs> well, yeah. let's, let's think about yeah. it from Truman's perspective, though, because that blood is on his hands basically more than anybody. He did declare, like, drop the bombs, we're doing it. So for Oppenheimer to be weepy and sad about it is sort of implying, hey, you should be feeling the same remorse and regret. And as a true tr- uh, Chad gentleman or whatever, uh, Truman, you know, denies those emotions and uh, maybe the the guilt he feels inside himself he unleashed on Oppenheimer and was being a big dick to him about it. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's the kind of thing where it's like politicians and the complex, like, these are the ones that are, like, asking people to make these weapons, but the scientists are the ones who are figuring out how it will work and, like, not making duds, not making failures, not, like, sabotaging <laughs> how this will work. Uh, so I think they share co-equal kind of uh, credit or responsibility yeah. for the creation of the bomb. But uh, in a way, I do think it is that kind of like the president has to take it on himself, it, like the sin eater, the, the person who's responsible for all of this ultimately. But Oppenheimer is the one who made it work. So, yeah. Yep. But there, there we go again, guys. The theme of like two opposite things being in the same space. You got mm-hmm. the, the person who made the bomb and the person who called it who was actually responsible, right? But, like, this, yeah. it's like it's such a good fucking movie. <laughs> yeah, it good makes you think. Movie. It makes you yeah. dread like the the modern society we live in. And okay, this is one of the, my favorite. Somebody tweeted this out: is that somebody asked, "Is there a post credit scene for Oppenheimer?" And somebody retweeted that and quoted it and said, you're fucking living in it. You're living <laughs> in the post credit scene of Oppenheimer. So true. <laughs> yeah, that was such a good scene. Oh my God. Oh, oh I can't, I can't. My, my dick is so hard talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we, much like your dick, should we wrap it up? Uh, do we have any final <laughs> thoughts on Oppenheimer? Watch fucking Oppenheimer, guys. Like to everyone listening to the podcast, fucking listen, listen to me. Watch Oppenheimer, IMAX, Atmos, 7mm, what? Just, just fucking do it. Just, just, you owe it to society. Society will be a better place if you watched Oppenheimer. And you come out of the movie not being a retard saying, it's too long, where are the Japanese people, where are the Mexican people from Los Alamos, shut the fuck up. Just, it's a fucking biopic, you dumb fuck. It's not about 
Oh, shit. Yeah, it's about Oppenheimer and his experience, and yeah. clearly he did not care about the Mexicans or whatever, the Hispanics yeah. he was kicking off of he Los Alamos. He say give the land back to them. Back to the, at the end of the- yeah. 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 So if he did not, like, directly interact with them, why would that be in the movie? I don't know, because Monkey, they're idiots who don't really have any <laughs> cinematic talent. Well, if they had any fucking did. talent, if they had I'd talent... I guess he did. They just didn't yeah, include did. that. Because he, he, he was very fond of the almost... Uh, yeah, yeah the same. area beforehand. Um, my final thoughts on this movie. I think that this is my favorite Nolan movie. Uh, I think that he has kind of stepped up to make this movie in a way. He's utilizing a lot of the like tools he's he's uh, mastered throughout his career. A lot of his like preoccupations with time, with how he shows us things. Like Dunkirk had the same kind of like playing with different elements of time and showing you different snatches of of history and 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 bits and pieces of it but i feel like between the way he structures this movie and the pacing of this movie it's kind of incredible jennifer lame is the editor of this thing and i think she deserves some kind of editing award because you do not feel the runtime of this movie as you're experiencing it it is just an absolute breakneck pace of conversations almost montage like in the way that it's it's presented and i just feel like he was the perfect man to make this movie and it's such a perfect encapsulation of the time the man the technology the the physics and just everything about it killian murphy's performance all the actors they disassemble the effects the music just everything it, it all just comes together to make what I think is a five-star movie, a perfect movie. So go see Oppenheimer. Go pay respects to to Nolan and Bravo Nolan. <laughs> uh, weekend, you have uh, your Oppie speech to give. Oh, I just I was just gonna say that you should. I, I kind of said it already. I'm just gonna say, j- just the kill shot, retard. If you don't like non-Japanese people, not. Japanese people not being in a movie. Make your own fucking movie. Oppenheimer is great. Shut the fuck up. Th- that that's it. You should watch Oppenheimer. Well, and I think the, like the the point is is well made that like the Japanese people have made movies about yeah. what it's like in a society that was Fu- barefoot again. Fire grave of green ripped fireflies. Of fireflies. Yeah. Godzilla. A lot of these movies deal with what living in a post nuclear society is like. As the people who have been nuked. Now, in, at any point in those movies, do they apologize to the rape of Nan King or apologize to <laughs> Pearl Harbor? Or are we just supposed oh. to let them act like they're the victim here? Oh, you should ask the fucker that tweeted, where are the Japanese people at? Like, it's a never-ending cycle of whatever, right? It's just that when you bring, when, you, when you're authentic, when you want to bring something out and you tell it in a great way, in an artistic way, it's an achievement. And you, you thinking about the optics just ruins whatever value the art has. So you should just either make your own shit or just enjoy it for what it was, right? It's it's also the most inane shit. Like, oh, it's so. Sh- I I I don't want to rant about how stupid people are about Oppenheimer. <laughs> I just want to celebrate Oppenheimer. So I I want everyone to watch it. I think it's it's like the best movie of the year. I can't wait for Blue Beetle now. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. That's going to be the new oh, best after, movie. Yeah. The only Blue thing Beetle that comes can out of this is Killers of the Flower Moon. I think oh, we'll, we'll see yeah. what that movie's like. But, uh, yeah. I th- yeah, I think for Oscars next year, those are the two movies that are going to fight. Unless there's some drama shit that Kino Corner will tell us about. <laughs> 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 Well, this might be insensitive for me to bring up, but you know, this is the second half of our Barbenheimer review, and I would like to point out that both Barbie and Oppenheimer were written by the director of the film, and all the movies this summer that failed were written by committee, giant groups of these writers, the very same people who are now on strike. And I'm wondering, uh, maybe we're just better off without these committee writers. Maybe just have the auteurs who know how to direct their own movie. Maybe just let them write their own movies. Fuck these fucking movies by no, committee. But, Fuck them. No, look, look. Make look, a good movie if you want me to care about your strike, goddammit. It's called, it's called an industry, though. Like, Get everything fucked. <laughs> I don't care. Made, I, I would much rather have, like, hundreds of movies come out 
and some of them or a lot of them be bad than just have like three or four come out. Hey, I think all the best movies ever made were written and directed by the same person and I'm getting sick of these movies written by eight different people. So I'm that's disagree. my insensitive comment of the day. Disagree. That's fine. <laughs> uh, do we have any uh, thing to plug this week? Hmm. Also, Find check out uh, at... Blue Sky. No, you mean X. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> fuck! God damn it! Check me out on X at T Z A R R E V A N. And then on Blue Sky at Revan1138 if you uh, are on Blue Sky. E Rich, can you tell me the web address of X? <laughs> uh, I believe it's twitter.com. <laughs> <laughs> For now, by the time this comes out, it might not be anymore. But I, I don't know that he can get X.com. I feel like somebody already has it. I think he bought it like 20 years ago and has been trying to find an excuse to use it. Oh, let's just go to X.com and see what happens. Yeah, it might go to Twitter. Oh it's like Oppenheimer. How can someone so smart be so retarded? It does. It just redirects to Twitter. You're yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> so go to x.com slash eRich. <laughs> wow. Oh, it does? Really? Oh, I'm gonna test it out. Mm -hmm. Oh my fucking god. <laughs> he bought x.com just to redirect it to Twitter. I think that's probably just until he figures out how to get yeah. it to x.com, but yeah. A weekend, do you have anything you want to plug this week? Well, if he, if all goes to plan, my Barbenheimer review has come out, and you should check that out. Hell yeah. So if you haven't gotten enough of Weekend talking about Barbenheimer, go check out yeah. Weekend talking about Barbenheimer. Yeah. I'm gushing. Hell yeah. Gushing about Oppenheimer and thinking that Barbie's mid point five. Okay. Now, are you going to give Everidge credit in the description for all the ideas and points that you steal from him? <laughs> oh, he oh he hell yeah. Just shout course. out to Everidge well, McCoy. You, know, you, should, I, you should take your resources, goddammit. I stole them from somebody else, so the, the cycle oh, continues. There's no hell original yeah. ideas out there. Shout out to nope. the sag after people or whatever. I am become <laughs> x.com destroyer of <laughs> points. <laughs> okay, I just say as a kill shot before we wrap up, I still cannot uh -huh. fucking believe the She-Hulk writer even gets royalties for, for writing that shit. Yeah, she, they should I mean, be happy look, to get that $300. Look, look, no matter what it is, if it is successful, that person should share in that success. Am okay, I right? Fair. Yeah, but uh, She-Hulk uh, is not no, propelling no, new what? revenue month after month. No, no, I, I'm like the conceit of the person who feels like they're entitled to more than that. I guess is what if it's successful is. they are like if, like if the, it's the, not then I mean I the show got canceled but... yeah I don't think she hook is successful the no she, the I think it's I think money. It, okay somebody can okay. correct me if I'm wrong but I think it's one of their more shows yeah I think it, it got a lot of see okay okay this is like somebody said this on Twitter this is the thing to have the writer know how much they're entitled to the streaming services will have to put out their numbers. I think that's something they're not mm -hmm. willing to show because that, that will spoil the pot, right? That that will show who's actually watching whatever the fuck. So they might not want to release it because then people would know how little people are actually watching something or how much people are watching something. Either way, they're fucked. Okay, I just don't like She-Hulk. Okay, that's the <laughs> Yeah, at least the Kino of Velma got a season two. Hell yeah. Mm. Can't wait, guys. Stay tuned. The... <laughs> uh, I think we that's it for... End... Wait, we can't fucking end on Velma. Sure what? we can. Oh, Fuck it. <laughs> yeah, go check out Oppenheimer. Um, I don't exactly agree with these guys that you must see this in 70mm IMAX. I think if you watch a Blu-ray at home, you'll still enjoy the film. Mm -hmm. Uh... You know, I mean, it is it is a lot of people just sitting in boardrooms and talking, so you don't I necessarily mean, need a 10-mile-tall screen to watch this movie. I mean, if you're a pleb, that's fine. That's right? fine. I mean, again, all the IMAX screenings are sold out through the end of history, so... That's you know, kind of amazing. Don't feel bad if you have to watch this on DVD. Mm -hmm. But for Barbenheimer, I've been Simeon Jimmy. Velmaheimer. Watch a episode of Velma, then go see Oppenheimer, then watch another <laughs> episode of Velma afterwards. And Wait. hopefully you'll be much more depressed when you uh, watch that second well, episode. Let's put this show on a Klosenheimer now, guys. So... <laughs> <laughs> Bye.